Darkfire Audio presents Call of the Herald, Book One in the Dawning of Power Trilogy, written by Brian Rathbone, narrated by Chris Snellgrove. Chapter 8 The righteous are bound by duty to enlighten the heathens and emancipate the souls of those beyond reform. Archmaster Belegra The next few days passed more quickly than Catherine had thought they would. Her wounds were healing well, and she spent most of her time dressing, butchering, salting, and smoking the game Benjen and Chase brought back. Strom had had some luck with a fishing hole, and there were fish to be filleted, then cooked, salted, or smoked. Racks made of fresh-hewn saplings now lined one of the cavern walls, and a few were already laden with cured venison, pork, and fish. Strom had been elected to find fruits and nuts, and he brought in apples, berries, and sacks of black walnuts. As the provisions mounted, Benjen said, I'm pleased with your work but we still need at least three times what we have if we're to survive the winter. I'd rather not live here, but if I must, I don't want to go hungry. That was the mantra that kept the young people working. No one was happy with the prospect of a prolonged stay, but they tried not to dwell on it. Their lives depended on the work they had to do, which meant less idle time to speculate about the future and the fates of their loved ones. Despite Katrin's rapid recovery, Benjen continued to apply humorous paste to her skin, though he used it sparingly to conserve his supply of herbs. Katrin gladly retired her walking stick when she could put weight on her leg without any pain. Benjen described a few herbs he thought might grow in the area and asked them to harvest only half of any plants they found, making sure to leave enough for repopulation. If you only find one or two plants, just pick a few leaves. Some will be better than none, he said. Within a few weeks, they had food to last until spring with strict rationing. They had to use the last of their salt supply, however, and their herb-gathering efforts had produced little. There's no help for it, I suppose, Benjen said when he shook the last of the salt from the bag, too little to even cover a perch fillet. We can't smoke too much meat without giving away our location— we need to eat as much fresh meat and fish as possible until we can no longer hunt. Any food that'll keep is off limits. We'll need it before spring arrives, no doubt. I want Strom and Katrin to gather more black walnuts, since they seem to be plentiful, and any other nuts or fruits you find. I know I've been pushing you all hard, but I've little choice in the matter. The storms can be intense this high in the mountains, and the snow doesn't melt till spring. Once the snow start... We could be trapped in here until spring. We need to gather more food so we can eat comfortably this winter, and we're going to need a much larger supply of firewood. I want you to spend half of each day hunting and foraging, and the other half collecting wood. If you can do both at once, then you'll certainly impress me. I'm going to look for herbs. Our supply is far too small for my liking, and I know the places they like to hide, he said with a wink as he shouldered his pack. When Benjen returned that evening, he was laden with plants and roots, and he entered the cavern with a big smile. I feel a bit better now. I should have enough medicinal herbs to deal with most ailments. But try not to fall off any cliffs and watch out for snakes, he said. Along with the herbs, he produced turnips, asparagus, and even some wild garlic, which he used to make a delicious soup. I hope we don't have to eat all of these walnuts to survive, Strom said while he and Katrin were returning from one of their many nut-gathering outings, and she admitted that she was dreading the winter as much as he. Tension grew as the weeks passed, and even Benjen began to show signs of worry. One night he sat them all down around the fire. Wendell and I made an agreement— if he hadn't joined us within forty days, then I was to sneak back as close to Harberton as I could to see what's going on. 
I'm going to leave tomorrow before dawn, but I only plan to be gone for four or five days. You all know to remain quiet and stay hidden. Keep the fire small and try not to leave obvious signs of your passage when you're out hunting and gathering, he lectured. Maybe I should go with you, Chase offered. It'll be a very dangerous task, and I'm more experienced at this kind of thing. I want you all to stay here and continue on as you have been, but be extra careful. You must protect one another. What if you don't come back in five or six days? Osborne asked, concern written clearly on his face. The best thing you can do is keep yourself safe and carry on as you have been. If you think you've been spotted, or if you need to escape, try to go east. About a half day's walk from here, there's a large river. Follow the river north. When you reach the waterfall, climb to the top if you can, and then follow the valley north by northeast, Benjamin said, pausing a moment to look into the troubled faces in front of him to gauge their concern. I don't think you'll have any trouble. You're well hidden here. Just remember to stay inside as much as possible and keep quiet. You'll have enough provisions to last through the winter if you use good judgment. Strom, take the first watch and wake Chase for the second. I'm going to need my sleep tonight, he said before retiring to his bedroll. Katrin and the others exchanged worried glances, but didn't speak. They wanted to know what was going on outside their hideaway, but they feared for Benjen's safety. The tension in the cavern was palpable. Katrin woke in the dead of night to find Benjen already gone. Chase sat near the fire and waved when he saw her sit up, and she joined him by the fire. How long ago did he leave? She asked quietly. It's been quite a while. His idea of morning is more like the middle of the night, he replied. He declined her offer to take the rest of the watch, and instead they talked until dawn. Though most of his wounds had healed, Pete and Ross still walked with a limp, and not a moment passed that he did not feel pain. Yet no one showed him the slightest bit of favor or kindness. He was just another refugee, lumped in with commoners and men he wouldn't let shine his boots. The stench alone was enough to make him want to escape, but it was the chance to prove his bravery and worth to Rosette and everyone else that was too alluring to resist. She and the others had shunned him ever since the snake incident. Even knowing the snake was harmless, Peton recoiled from the thought of its touching him. He would prove Rosette and the others wrong. While most chose to spend their time wallowing in self-pity, Peton had been looking for a way out. There were too many people confined in the master house, and he was convinced that Wendell Volker and those who followed him to the cold caves were getting fat on the Ross family's meat. For generations his family had been storing sides of beef in the cold caves, but only now did that practice seem a liability. It infuriated Peton that he should have to endure a strict ration when those who didn't deserve it dined on his food. Things had seemed hopeless until Peton met a dirty little man whose name he did not remember, nor care to know. All that was important was that this man was willing to reveal some of the Master House's secrets for nothing more than a few silvers. When everyone else was asleep, Peton walked on the tips of his toes over the still bodies that seemed to carpet the cold flagstones. One man cursed him when he stepped on a finger, but no one else seemed to notice or care. At the entrance to the hall that led to the sacred chambers, those denied to the refugees, a bored-looking guard seemed to be having trouble keeping his eyes open. It seemed an eternity that Peton waited, but then the moment came. The guard let his eyes droop closed. After waiting for a few more anxious moments, Peton moved as quietly as he could past the guard, his limp making the act of being silent even more difficult. His right foot seemed to want to drag across the stone with every step, and he gritted his teeth against the pain. Voices carried through the halls, and Peton flattened himself against the corridor wall, feeling exposed and vulnerable. Can smell the boiling vermin from here. Won't be much longer before that problem is. The voices faded, and Peton hastily resumed his quest 
suddenly panicking, worried he had forgotten what the man told him. Was it left at the fifth hall, then right at the third, or was it the other way around? Sweat dripped into his eyes as he concentrated. Part of him wanted to give up, to go back and hide with his family and friends, but another part seemed to have awakened. He could make a difference. His actions could save countless lives. In his mind, he played through the drama and pageantry that he imagined would follow his great victory. His people needed a leader, a person who would take action in the face of death, and he was that leader. All he had to do was prove that to everyone. With determination, he strode forward as fast as his limp would allow. Following his gut instinct, he turned left when he reached the fifth hall and right at the third. No more voices broke the silence, and finding the room the man had told him about sent Peton's confidence soaring. If only his confidence could defeat the smell, which was worse than the smell of the refugees. The thought of climbing through a sewer made Peton want to retch, but it was the path to his salvation. Driven by his need for power and a deeper, almost unrecognizable feeling of responsibility for those he cared about, he entered the sewer. The journey was something he hoped he could erase from his memory for all time, but he doubted it. At least the man had been true to his word about leaving a torch. Obtaining flint from a fellow refugee had cost him another silver, but it was coin well spent. Without the torch, he would have been lost. When he rounded a corner and saw a splash of dim light illuminating the way ahead, though, he quickly tossed the torch into the fetid water. When he reached the grate, he nearly wept. Grasping at the bars that blocked his way, he cursed the dirty little scoundrel who had sent him on a fool's quest. Anger boiled in his belly, and he growled in fury. It took every scrap of will he possessed to refrain from crying out, from venting his rage on the heavens. In his anger, his muscles contracted, and he could feel the bars digging into his flesh. But then something amazing happened. One of the bars began to move. It was only the slightest movement, but it was enough. Increasing the pressure, Peton began to push and pull on the bar as hard as he could. Mortar fell away in large chunks, and with a suddenness that sent Peton stumbling backward, the bar gave way. Again, Peton had to refrain from crying out as he pushed his way past the remaining bars. Rock and metal bit into his skin and left him with a dozen minor cuts, but he gained the fresh air and his freedom. The drainage ditch that ran from the mouth of the sewer ended at a small cove so fouled and stagnant that no one would stay near it for long, and Peton decided that it could be no worse than the sewers had been, and it was his best chance to slip into the water undetected. Beyond the cove, he bathed in the crashing waves, letting them blast the foulness from him, but the smell seemed to follow him no matter how hard he scrubbed. In the end, he gave up washing and concentrated on swimming, and at times wading his way along the coast. The sun began to rise, as if Vestra wished to expose him to the Jean. Peton cursed his luck and looked for a good place to leave the water and gain the shore. He had seen no shadows and heard no voices for quite some time, and he knew he needed to cover a lot of distance in a hurry. When he reached the shore, he climbed a pair of massive stones that cradled an ancient tree between them. Using a branch to pull himself up, he had no time to react, and not the slightest chance of avoiding the boot heel that was hurtling toward his face. In an instant, the world went dark. A broken twig and a plant that stood at an angle, its leaves crumpled and broken, were Benjamin's first warning, and it was far too close to their hideaway for his comfort. There were more signs as he moved closer to the populated lands. Years of training became fresh in his mind once again, as the need for stealth became paramount. When he neared the farm, his fears grew. It seemed the Jean were everywhere at once. Their numbers were difficult to believe, and he considered abandoning his quest, but the need for information drew him on. 
It was all too clear to him now that they would not be able to remain in the cavern until spring. De Jean would tear down the forest and pick the mountains clean if that was what it took. When he reached the tree line that bordered the farm, he crouched behind a tree and waited. Soldiers milled around the area, and he thought he might have to wait until dark. In the distance a bell rang, and many of the soldiers stopped what they were doing and headed back toward Harberton. A few remained. Not perfect, Benjamin said to himself, but it's an improvement. One man went to the well, and two others walked toward the cottages. No one else could be seen. Benjamin made his move and charged up to the back of the barn. Looking through a knothole in the barn door, he checked for Jean, but saw none. Doing his best to be quiet, he slid the door partly open and slipped in. First he went to the feed stall and was pleased to find that the Jean had not taken everything. A salt block sat in the corner, and there were still some oats in one of the barrels. Being as quiet as possible, he broke up the salt block and put it into a couple of sacks that had been hanging from a wooden peg. He put some of the oats in a sack as well, but he did not take too much, knowing he could carry only so much and still maintain his stealth. It took time to carry each sack into the loft, but he figured this was the safest place to hide them until he came back. The loft was also where he'd hidden his sword, and he pulled it from behind some bales of moldy hay. He had considered taking it with him when they first left for the mountains, but he hadn't been able to bear the thought of talking to Katrin about her mother. He could not lie to her, and if she saw the sword, she would surely have questions. Any answers he gave to those questions would certainly have led to questions about Elsa. The memories were still painful for him, and he could see no good that would come from revealing things to Katrin that would only confuse and hurt her. Now, though, his need outweighed his desire to spare Katrin the pain of knowing. Even as the thought occurred to him, he heard the barn's front door open and the sound of horses walking into the barn. In the next moment he heard something that chilled his bones and made him curse his own stupidity. Why is the back door open? Someone asked in Jean Lander. Benjamin hadn't heard it spoken in many years, but he recognized the peril of his situation immediately. After making sure the sacks of salt and grain were well hidden, he climbed over the bales of straw that were stacked almost to the angled roof line. Squeezing himself through the cobwebs, he ducked under the rafters that gave him barely enough room to pass. When he finally reached the other side, he quietly slid down into the small open area between the straw pile and the back door of the loft. From what he could hear, the soldiers below had not called out or raised the alarm, but he heard them climb to the loft. As quietly as he could, Benjamin opened the loft door just enough to see if anyone was outside. When the way looked clear, he opened the door and climbed out onto the narrow ledge that ran along the top of the barn doors. With his back to the barn, Benjamin closed the door and scooted himself sideways until he reached the makeshift ladder he'd built many years ago. It had taken only a few scraps of barn board cut into short strips and nailed to the side of the barn to create a nearly invisible ladder. As he climbed down it, he was thankful for his own ingenuity. When he reached the bottom, he saw the soldiers coming back down from the loft, and he raced to the fence. Using his momentum and a hand on the top rail, he launched himself over the fence. In truth, he was lucky his grip did not miss the top rail, since the entire fence was overgrown with honeysuckle and blackberry bushes. It was the growth that gave him cover while he fled. Running while crouched is not an easy thing to do, and his knees ached terribly when he finally reached the tree line. From there, he watched and rested. The Jean seemed quite relaxed. They had taken Harberton and the Highlands, and now those who remained to hold these seemed content to get fat on what had been left behind by the people of the Godfist. Anger and resentment burned in Benjamin's belly, and when a sentry came too close, he moved without hesitation. Silently, he approached the bored-looking soldier and caught him completely by surprise. Using his momentum and leverage to focus the power of his muscles, Benjamin landed a devastating punch that dropped the soldier without a sound. 
After dragging the man back to the tree line, Benjen took his uniform and left him there. Knowing it was only a matter of time before someone noticed the sentry was missing or found his body, Benjen hurried through the trees looking for the game trail he used to hunt. When he found it, he took a moment to change into the soldier's uniform and he stashed his clothes near the trail. He tucked his hair beneath the jacket collar and hoped his disguise would be sufficient, though he knew it was thin. Getting to Harberton was as easy as following a series of trails through the woods that dominated the foothills, but when he reached the edge of town, his task became a great deal more difficult. The darkness his only boon. After sifting through a garbage heap on the outskirts, Benjen found some things that might help him get to the watering hole without having to answer any questions. He cut the top off an old leather flask and filled it with a noxious mixture of rotting vegetables and stale wine, and he hid the flask within his coat. When the moon was high, Benjen walked the streets, doing his best to look as if he belonged there. Careful planning took him along a route that he guessed would have the least traffic. One street ran along a narrow canal whose smell kept most people at a distance, and another was little more than a dirty alley between two rows of buildings. The refuse that had accumulated there over many years made getting through difficult, but Benjen was grateful for it. At the end of the alley, he could see his destination. The faded and chipped sign above the inn had always been a welcoming sight, but now Benjen knew better. The Jean religion declared churches and libraries sacred and decreed that they must not be destroyed during the conquest of a city, but it was the soldiers who declared inns sacred. It was a long-standing practice that those the Jean conquered were allowed to continue a limited and heavily taxed business, and it appeared this was still the case, for the sounds coming from the watering hole indicated the inn was still operating. Benjen could only hope that Miss Maris was well and still running the inn. Taking a deep breath, he prepared himself for what would likely be the most dangerous part of his journey. A patrol of soldiers walked the streets looking half asleep and utterly disinterested, and Benjen waited for them to pass. As soon as they were out of sight, he left the safety of the shadows and walked into the moonlight, hoping no one chose this moment to leave the inn. As he crossed the street, a loud outburst of laughter emanated from inside, and Benjen nearly leaped from his skin, but no one emerged. With an ill-advised burst of speed, he covered the last bit of distance between himself and the shadows alongside the inn. Just as he rounded the corner, he encountered a soldier who'd been relieving himself in the bushes. "'Who's there?' the man asked in Jean Lender, and Benjen nearly stumbled as he was taken by surprise. Quickly he turned and leaned over, making vomiting sounds and pouring some of his foul mixture on the ground. "'If you can't hold your drink, you shouldn't indulge,' the man said as he came closer. "'What's your name, soldier? Whom do you serve under?' Benjen felt a hand on his shoulder, and he prayed for good luck. As he turned toward the soldier, he never raised his head, and he made more wrenching noises, and then he poured the rest of his mixture on the man's boots. The soldier stepped back, and Benjen waited to see if his plan had worked or if it would be the end of him. The soldier must have gotten a whiff of the foul mixture, and Benjen heard his stomach heave. Without another word, the man turned and left, probably hoping to keep the contents of his stomach where they were. As soon as the man turned the corner, Benjen stumbled around the back of the inn and was pleasantly surprised to find the back door unguarded. Miss Maris's kitchen looked much as it always had, save there were fewer people and a lot less food to be seen, and now there was an oppressive pall of desperation that hung in the air. When the kitchen door suddenly swung inward, Benjen crouched down, but Miss Maris saw him instantly. Her face registered no surprise or fear. She simply held a finger to her lips, grabbed half a loaf of bread, and walked back to the common room. Admiring her strength, Benjen moved to a darkened corner and waited. It took some time for Miss Maris to convince her unwelcome guests that the inn was closing for the evening, but she eventually came back to find Benjen. Again she held a finger to her lips and led him to the cellar, which, like most cellars, was damp, cold, 
and had a smell like moldy soil. It's good to see you, Benjamin, she said after leading him to a place between the stacks of crates and barrels, most of which appeared to be empty. There's been much worry over the safety of you and those in your care. We worried about you as well. I've got it good compared to most. I have to put up with the scoundrels in my inn, but I have most of my freedom. As for the rest, things could be a great deal better. Benjamin nodded his agreement, and they settled down to discuss their plans. When five days had passed and Katrin and the others still had seen no sign of Benjamin, they were worried, but they tried to be optimistic. I'm sure he's just being extra careful, and all the rain we've been having is probably slowing him down as well, Chase said. Knowing Benjamin, he's probably so overloaded with salt and cheese that he'll barely make it back before the first snow, Strom laughed. After ten days, the group was anxious and restless. Katrin had so much pent-up energy, she thought she could probably sprint all the way to the ocean. She was fretful and paced constantly. I'm going fishing, Strom announced, clearly wishing to escape the oppressive atmosphere, even if it was only to sit in the rain. Chase seemed to share his desire. I think I'll go hunting in the high reaches today, he said nonchalantly. The high reaches? Katrin asked. What kind of game do you expect to find up there? Goat? Perhaps no game at all. I want to find a high place with a good view of the valley. I have a bad feeling about Benjamin. No one disagreed, and Strom offered to go with him, but they jointly decided one person stood less of a chance of being spotted than two. They were going against Benjamin's orders, but they all felt compelled to do something, anything. Katrin and Osborne felt helpless, left without much to do. I think we should keep watch while they're gone, Osborne said, looking pale and shaken. I'll take first watch. I'm going to look again for another exit from the cavern, in case we need it, Katrin said. She retrieved a coil of rope and a couple of torches that Benjamin had fashioned and made her way back to the old raft. She lowered the logs to the ground and lashed them together, it was a hot job, and her eyes burned with sweat by the time she finished, but the raft looked strong. She grunted with effort as she pushed off into the dark water. The raft seemed to float well, and she hoped it would be stable. She pulled it back to shore. Searching through the woodpile, she found a branch she could use to push herself across the water. It still had leaves on one end, and she hoped it would work like an oar if the water got too deep for poling. When she returned to the fire to light one of her torches, Osborne looked concerned. I don't think it's a good idea for you to go off on that raft. It's not safe. Nothing we do these days is safe. But don't worry, I'll be fine. Katrin put her spare torch on the raft, along with the rope and her makeshift oar, and climbed tentatively aboard the awkward craft, holding her lit torch aloft. Her weight caused the raft to sink lower into the water and at times it was almost completely submerged. Only her quick reactions kept the second torch from getting saturated. The sudden movements threatened to overturn the raft. It was precarious, but she was determined. Pulling and holding the torch up at the same time was hard, but she managed to move along the shoreline, still staying close to the cavern wall. There was no real shoreline this far out, but she did occasionally come across what appeared to have been other passageways leading into the cavern. They were all blocked with fallen rock and debris, and none appeared passable. As she became more adept at poling, she moved more quickly toward the far end of the cavern. The water grew deeper, and she had to put her entire arm in the water to reach the bottom with her pole. Eventually, the water was too deep to reach the bottom, and she pushed off the cavern walls when she could. Occasionally, she pushed herself out too far and had to paddle back. Her branch made a poor paddle, and at times she made more progress by setting the branch on the raft and paddling with her free hand. When she reached the back of the cavern, she came on a collapsed corridor that was larger than all the others. Fallen stone blocked this one too, but the size of the arch intrigued her, as she began to wonder if someone hadn't blocked the tunnels intentionally. 
a small breeze caressed her cheek. She sniffed the air, a bit dank, but not foul. After pushing the raft closer to the doorway, she latched onto some of the rocks that blocked it. She wedged her torch into a nearby crevice and pulled herself onto the top of a protruding rock, hoping the raft would not drift off. There wasn't much room for her on the small shelf of rock, but she managed to balance as she reached out to the raft. She had to stretch to grasp her rope, which she used to secure the raft to one of the jagged rocks at the bottom of the doorway. Cooler air continued to seep through the rocks, and Katrin loosened some of the top pieces. It was slow work, but she cleared a hole about the size of her head. She poked her torch into it to see what lay beyond. She could see very little, but it did appear that the quarter was mostly clear beyond the initial blockage. When she pulled her torch back, she noticed a narrow rectangular slit in the stone above the doorway, and shivered as she recalled the lessons that spoke of old castles having arrow slits above the entrances, often referred to as death holes. The sight of it was unsettling. She needed a much larger opening to crawl through, but several large stones were wedged tightly just below the hole she had created. She finally got one of the large rocks to wiggle, and it rocked back and forth, moving it a little more with every sweep. She gave it a hard yank and nearly fell from her perch when it jerked free, the stone hitting the water with a loud splash. Katrin leaned back against the rocks and took a couple of deep breaths. Are you all right? Osborne shouted across the water, and his words echoed loudly in the cavern. I'm fine. I found another passage, and I'm going to see where it goes. Don't be gone too long, Cat, he said in a quieter voice. I don't want to be here alone. I'll be back as soon as I can. The hollow left by the large stone gave her more room to work, and made the removal of the next one a bit easier. She soon had a hole she thought she could squeeze through. With her torch held through the hole, she saw the rubble pile sloping down and away on the other side. Dropping the torch onto the rocks on the other side, carefully as so not to extinguish it, she wriggled her way through the hole, getting slightly stuck when her belt knife caught on the stones. After freeing the knife, she slid farther through the hole. A rock broke away and moved out from under her hand, and she began to slide. She landed noisily, her face just inches from the burning torch she had tossed into the space. She wasn't bleeding, but she was sore in several places. After gathering her gear, she moved past the rest of the debris. The ceiling and walls were unbroken, and Katrin was convinced these halls had been sealed intentionally. It also occurred to her that whoever had done it had most likely done it in a hurry. Otherwise, the barrier would have been much more substantial. She recalled the arrow slits above the doorway and thought perhaps they had not needed much more of an obstruction. When she moved her torch closer, she could see how cleanly the stone had been cut. There were no visible seams in the smooth walls, which seemed to be one continuous surface. The floor was also smooth, though covered with a thick layer of dust and dirt. Walking slowly down the corridor, Katrin felt like an intruder in a place long lost to the living. Ahead, she saw a doorway, but there were no tracks in the dust on the floor, so she didn't think she would encounter any wildlife. Still, she crept ahead slowly, half expecting a specter to jump out at her. Instead, she found a short hall with several doorways on either side. She looked into one of the rooms and saw some crumbled pieces of pottery and rotted wood that may have once been a bed frame. In the other rooms, she found similar hints that these had once been sleeping chambers, but the rooms were rather small. She doubted they had been rooms for the wealthy, and she wondered if they had been servants' quarters. In another, she found a washbowl behind the ruins of another bed frame. The bowl was almost perfectly preserved, with the exception of one sizable chip out of the rim. It was unlike anything she had ever seen before. She bent down and wiped her finger across the surface to find under the dust that the bowl was shiny with elaborate designs below the glaze. As she bent down to inspect it more closely, a clump of reddish clay caught her attention. It was wedged inside one of the bed frame's wooden joints, as if it had been hidden there when the bed was still whole. 
Drawn to the clump by some mysterious desire, she pried it away from the disintegrating wood, and a small shape revealed itself. In the dwindling light of her torch, it appeared to be a carving of a fish, made from some kind of milky crystal, its surface porous and rough. She placed the little carving in her pocket, and in that moment saw her torch was not far from burning out. She had been gone a while, and she figured Osborne was probably worried. She turned back, eager to tell him what she had found. Though she hoped not to use it, her spare torch was tucked into her belt. When the first torch sputtered out, she had to quickly decide if she wanted to light the spare while the first was still hot enough to ignite it. She decided to save it since she was not far from the opening, and her vision would eventually adjust to the darkness. Shuffling along the smooth wall, she worked her way back to the pile of stone and poked her head through the hole. The raft waited below, and she was grateful it had not gotten loose. Looking across the water, she saw Osborne's silhouette leaning against the wall near the cavern entrance. Sliding forward carefully, she was in a very awkward position when shuffling noises and deep voices shouting words she did not understand suddenly echoed in the cavern. Twisting her neck and body so she could see across the water again, she saw three shadowy forms outlined against the light of the no longer shaded entrance. Helplessly, she watched as two large men tackled Osborne and tied his hands and ankles behind his back. Two more forms entered the cavern, and she knew she needed to escape. Jerking herself back through the hole, she retreated into the dark corridor. For a brief moment, she stopped to think. There was nothing she could do to help Osborne, but horrifying visions of Osborne as a captive tormented her. She was no match for two grown men, let alone four, especially not men as large as those, and she had no idea what her next move would be. With four redfish in his sack, Strom stood and stretched his legs. A light rain fell, thoroughly soaking him, but at least he was outside. He had never been afraid of confined spaces, but the cavern made him feel like the world was closing in on him. Breathing in the fresh air, he started back toward the cold and dark of the cavern. His fears returned as he got closer, and he wondered what would happen to Katrin next. It was as if the gods were toying with her. Thoughts of the gods had always seemed distant to him, but now he was overwhelmed by nagging questions. The rules of his world had suddenly changed, and he was no longer certain what was real. It was almost too much for him to absorb, and he turned his mind to the task of getting back safely. Not far from the cavern entrance, he encountered Chase. Did you see anything? he asked. There's an army coming from the north, and I thought I saw movements in the trees, so I came back to check on everyone. Did you hear that? Strom asked. That sounded like it came from the cavern. Chase didn't bother to respond. Instead, he took off at a run, Strom close on his heels. When Benjen reached the farm, he sneaked back into the hayloft to retrieve the things he'd hidden there. Under the cover of darkness, he carried the sacks down from the loft and used a piece of rope to tie them together before he slung them over his shoulder. Then, knowing every moment he stayed only increased the danger, he made his way along the fence. Morning would arrive soon, and Benjen knew the chances of his escaping were rapidly dwindling. Surely someone would find the man he'd stolen the uniform from, and it was obvious that men were searching the mountains for Katrin. Quickening his pace, he tried to cover as much ground as possible before sunrise. When he reached the place where he'd first seen signs of soldiers in the mountains, he froze. Nearby the snap of a branch warmed of imminent danger, but he couldn't pinpoint from what direction it had come. Not wanting to lead anyone to Katrin and the others, he began moving in the opposite direction. The sound of moving leather was all the warning Benjen received before a sword whistled by his ear. Reeling from his evasive maneuver, Benjen let go of the string that held the sacks over his shoulder and rolled away from them. The soldier who stepped out from behind a nearby tree was a giant of a man, with muscles like cords of thick rope. His face showed no fear or battle frenzy. Instead, what Benjen saw was the cautious confidence of a seasoned warrior. Benjen managed only a single swing of his sword. 
the ill-timed and out-of-practice attack proved to be a critical mistake. Even as he swung, Benjen saw the man raise his thick sword to meet his strike. On the bottom of the soldier's blade, just before the crosspiece, was a large notch. With the precision of a practiced movement, like a dancer spinning in time with the music, the soldier lodged Benjen's blade into that notch and used his strength, leverage, and a quick snap of his wrist to shatter Benjen's sword. Left with only the handle and crosspiece of his sword, Benjen could only hope that a technique he'd learned long ago would allow him to use his opponent's size and strength against him. 